Thank you so much, Jorge. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. I'm going to be sharing the presentation at the same time as I'm going to be looking at you all. So you might see me look this way and this way. So that's the reason why. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sosan Abdurrahman. I'm Chief Arizona's Clean and Green Campaign Manager. Very happy to be here with you today. Um, thank you so much, Jorge, for getting us started. And thank you to Jackie and Monse for providing interpretation. Also want to give a big thank you to Sese for the beautiful land acknowledgement to ground us um, in today's meeting. Today, uh, we are gonna be learning about Chispa's Clean and Green campaign, uh, focusing today on this public transit portion. Over the course of the year, we'll be diving deeper into other parts of the campaign, both through social media and our events like our Escuelita. But for today, we're gonna be learning about um, a few important concepts, including electric vehicle technology, public transportation, and uh, we'll also be hearing from the City of Phoenix Office of Sustainability, where we'll be uh, presented their draft electric vehicle roadmap. And at the end of their presentation, we'll be able to provide some feedback um, as well. Some policies and government associations that we're gonna be learning about in today's presentation includes Proposition 300, Proposition 400, Proposition 400 Extension, and the Maricopa Association of Governments. And I know that sounds like a lot of jargon. Uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you can walk away um, with a good understanding of what all those policies and all those um, bodies of government do. So what is the Clean and Green Campaign? Our vision here at Chispa Arizona is to launch a 10 year education and accountability campaign to push for investments in public transit and tree shade equity. So this campaign is going to look a little bit different because it's not going to be around a specific election cycle, but rather it's something that the organization will be working on and towards over the next decade. The first year is looking like a lot of visioning and research and relationship building with our allies at the city and at the county, and also community education and outreach kind of like we're doing here today. Um, so the Clean and Green campaign will work with regional leaders like the City of Phoenix, community-based organizations like our amazing partners at Chispa Arizona, and community residents like yourselves to secure the resources that prioritize the investments our community and environment need most related to electric vehicle, public transit and infrastructure, urban green spaces, tree shade, and complete streets. What does that long run on sentence mean? Essentially, we're working to hold accountable our regional leaders and ensure that they're investing money in our community and in our environment in the areas that we need it most when it comes to our region's development. Opportunities to engage and provide input and feedback include sessions like today, but also include incoming federal, public, and private grant money that our city is starting to receive and um, that they will be able to make decisions on when it comes to investing in our region's transit. So moving into the why, why are we launching the, cre uh, the Clean and Green campaign? So um, we've identified a few issues as an environmental justice organization in our region that are priorities to our community. And one of the major ones is unchecked growth and urban sprawl. The Phoenix metro area is now the fastest growing city in the country, and it grows in a type of development pattern um, known as urban sprawl. If you live here in Phoenix, you know what I'm talking about. Our city just continues to grow further and further and further out. Um, and this type of settlement pattern is economically inefficient, it's socially inequitable, and it's environmentally damaging. And so we hope to develop a transit system that allows us to be more dense as a city rather than spread out. Another issue that we've identified is our region's air quality. We know that the Phoenix metro area is now the fifth most polluted city in our country when it comes to air quality. Um, and that has a direct impact on the respiratory health of, of our communities and of ourselves as residents who are living here. And so it's extremely important that we mitigate the worst by getting some of our tailpipe emissions off the road and improving our region's air quality. Urban heat island effect is another issue that's um, impacting our region. Uh, the Phoenix metro area is extremely hot. Uh, the National Weather Service recorded 53 days over 110 degrees 
in 2020. And we know that that's just going up and up every single year. Over the past five years, heat has been linked to more than 1,500 deaths here in Arizona. Uh, and with the worsening housing crisis that we have right now, this is having devastating impacts on our unsheltered neighbors in particular. Um, another issue that we're hoping to address is mobility. Um, here in our region, there's a lack of reliable and extensive public transportation, and this poses a significant barrier to employment and people's just general mobility, particularly for folks who don't have a car for whatever reason, whether that's affordability or a disability that doesn't allow them to operate a vehicle. Um, folks who do not have a car often struggle to get around our region. And so we're hoping to address the issue of mobility as well. And lastly, um, we're hoping to center racial justice and equity in our campaign. We know that there's a lot of data that indicates social factors such as race and income have been found to determine who are the most vulnerable communities to increasing temperatures and poor air quality in urban cities, more specifically finding that there are significant disparities between the East Valley and Phoenix and the South and the West Valley of Phoenix, um, with Black, Indigenous, and communities of color being the most vulnerable populations. And so as our region continues to grow and as we continue to receive resources for investment, we're pushing to make sure that we are over-investing in the communities that have traditionally been under-invested in. So the goals of the Clean and Green campaign are three. The first is to improve our region's air quality through 100% free and electric public transportation by 2035. And I wanna put an emphasis on the word free because at Chiefs Bay, Arizona, we recognize that it's incredibly important that everybody across the valley has access to mobility regardless of their income status. Um, so one of our major goals is both free transit and electric transit. The second goal of our campaign is to reduce our urban heat island effects by increasing 20% of tree shade canopies and investing in complete streets, specifically in South and West Phoenix by 2030. And the reason we're putting an emphasis on South and West Phoenix is because we know that there is a lack of tree shade equity in those parts of our, of our city. Um, and those communities have traditionally been left behind when it comes to those types of investments. So as our city is receiving money to plant more trees, we need to make sure that those trees are being planted in our communities. And lastly, our last goal, as we're uh, trying to accomplish goal one and two, is to center our work in racial justice and equity and center our region's development in racial justice and equity. As I mentioned before, there are communities that have been systemically and traditionally left behind. And so as our region continues to you know, be really competitive when it comes for, uh, to receiving federal grant money. We need to make sure that um, the communities that have been underinvested in are being overinvested in. And we also need to make sure that the people who are closest to the problem are the people who are giving us the solutions because it is often the people who are closest to the problem who have the best solutions. And so part of this campaign is also going to be elevating those voices in this conversation. And so now I wanna pass it over to Jorge. He's gonna give us a really deep dive critical analysis into electric vehicle technology. And I'll let him take it from here. Muchas gracias, Alson. Bueno, entonces ahora- Thank you so much. So now we're gonna move into the vehicle, electric transportation. So before I wanted to give a definition. So let's say that an electric vehicle is, you know, it can be a bus, a car, that instead of using a gas tank in order to be moving around, uh, we use a battery where it stores the energy in order to move. So instead of having to put gas in your car, you charge the battery in order to move. So what are some of the benefits of this type of technologies. One is that they are more quiet. So to say whenever they move, they don't make as much noise as buses or cars that we know today. They also have less, um, less parts, less parts in general for the car, they'll be more spacious and have lower maintenance costs. 
and they have the potential, all the potential for us to not be dependent on fossil fuels. Yeah, the, the fossil fuels or all the things that comes from petroleum or gasoline. And so we have that. One of the benefits, one of the best benefits for these cars are that whenever they go, they don't produce smoke, they don't produce emissions, so they don't have a tailpipe emissions. So that helps for if we have these types of vehicles in our communities, we're going to be breathing less contaminated air and cleaner air. They're great now for short distances. We can move in a day with a person that can travel about 40 miles round trip. So those are the, the ones we have today. Those are already good for everyday use. And then you see an image here to the right, and it shows how the price of lithium batteries are plummeting. So it has lowered so much. And these types of cars are a little bit more competitive. Even if they're a little bit pricier, we're trying to get better. And these cars, these electric vehicles are 77 more efficient when batteries transfer energy to electronic motor for movement. So it's about 77%. So to put it in perspective, a conventional car is efficient about 30 to 35% in converting gas energy into movement. So these are a lot of benefits that help us believe and know that it's a good option to have electric cars, or electric buses, but it's not all good. We can go to the next slide. So let's say that these vehicles come with a, co with a cost. Like I mentioned, they're a bit more expensive. They're more expensive than regular cars, but there are studies that show us that prices vary and there's examples of in Los Angeles, the cost of the vehicles changes to do too many factors. It could factors, it could be the price that we pay to charge our battery, the number of mileages, mileage that we do, and also the taxes that are there to incentivize these types of technologies. So there is a lot of good opportunities to be able to purchase these vehicles, but they are expensive. And some of the things that we have to invest in are infrastructure. And we'll get to hear a little bit more about the plans from Karen about the infrastructure and how you can charge your vehicle in the city. So, but yeah. And some of the cons that we have in with this type of technology is that we depend on how we are producing electricity to power these vehicles as to say so if you have solar panels and you're going to use that to charge your battery that car is going to be completely clean and yes it'll get a little check mark and that's the cleanest that you can get this day and age but if you charge it with electricity produced by we could say like CO2, it's gonna be a hybrid car. So the greenhouse gases that create these conditions are still an issue. So just to put an example, let's think about the the light train with from Phoenix. We say, oh, this doesn't have any emissions, any smoke. It's great, but if you think about well, I went into a website and I looked, what are the ways that electricity gets used in Arizona or gets powered? And we can say, oh yeah, 13% is coal fired. And so if we take that energy that we use to move that little train, you know, it comes from different sources that are not always clean, that are dirty or, so we want to be able to think about how we, better our electrical system 
so we can have more energy coming in that's clean and reduce our impact on those emissions. And also another con, I mean, temperatures, extreme cold or weather can affect the performance of this. And the studies of the life cycles of a car shows that there is a environmental impact by having a car. So we are, even if we are thinking that we're green, we're having an impact whether we think about it or not. So what I wanted to share was, yeah, just thinking about what are the batteries and what is the energy in order that's needed in order to have these type of things. So next slide. Okay, so let's say that batteries need a lot of materials and mining to be developed, like aluminum, nickel, cobalt, all the things. So we need to use water in order to get these. And we know through history that the mining industry has been very exploitative in the history. And it can be that the effects, we don't see it here directly in the United States, but they are there. So, I mean, we also have to think about how we're gonna recycle batteries that we produce, et cetera. So, as a conclusion, what I wanted to say in order to conclude is that it would be very unfortunate to think that electrical vehicles aren't the right solution because they're not perfect. And now I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that, yes, they're good, but we can't rely on just by being electric, that's good. And being influencing in the, in the businesses and so that they have good recycling practices and have our voice be heard, not just on the electric com electrical companies, um, like the Arizona Corporate Commission, but so we can create more renewable resources in our system so that we can have cleaner air. So, and then with that, this concludes my presentation. I'll pass it over to the next person. Thank you so much, Jorge, for your critical analysis. Um, it's so important that we're, as we're investing in electric vehicle technology for our region, um, that we must also be simultaneously pushing for our grid at the state level to shift to renewable sources if we want these changes to be truly meaningful for addressing our climate crisis. And so that's part of, you know, holding our regional leaders accountable um, as we're bringing in all this EV technology, we gotta be asking how are we working to transition our grade, uh, grid at the state level simultaneously. And it's also so important that when we talk about electric vehicle technology, that we discuss its limitations and we be honest about the fact that it is not a perfect solution, though it is a necessary step in the right direction it's not a perfect solution. And so being honest about these limitations really allows us to address the limitations and also improve on technology as we move forward. A really good thing about the clean and green energy sector is that it's constantly evolving and innovating. And I feel like every six months there's some new technology. And so um, as we're transitioning to better technology, we should also always be looking to what other better options are out there. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit from science and technology and move us over to talking about politics and government and power. Um, and most, most specifically, I want to talk a little bit today about the Maricopa Association of Governments or MAG. Uh, what is MAG? They are a long range planning agency for the Metro Phoenix area. And this includes the 27 cities and towns across our valley, also three native nations, parts of Maricopa County and portions of Pinal County. Within MAG, there are multiple committees. And one of the committees is a transportation policy committee. They are charged with developing our region's transportation policy. And they also provide oversight for the implementation of Proposition 400, which I will talk about a little bit more in our next slide. 
The Transportation Policy Committee is made up of 23 members. And the very interesting thing about this committee is that it provides a unique opportunity for business representatives to have a direct say in developing transportation policy for the region. And these six business uh, representations are from transit, freight, and construction. And I just think it's very interesting, as I've been doing research about this body, that you don't see public health experts represented on this committee, nor environmental experts, nor any community-based organizations um, who get to have an input on how our region's transit develops. So, you know, it's no wonder that the city of Phoenix is a city of urban sprawl and endless highways, because some of the people who make decisions on our region's development have a direct financial stake in continued urban sprawl and highway investment. So that's just something very interesting to think about as we've been doing research on this entity. Um, that's part of my role as our Clean and Green Campaign Manager. In the past, Chiefs Bay Arizona, we've engaged a lot with APS, the Arizona Corporation Commission, um, the state legislature. And this is a body that we're interested in engaging with more, a better understanding and learning how we can build power for community, um, public health, and the environment within this body. So I'll now talk a little bit more about the propositions I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first thing to remember here is that these two propositions are essentially the same thing. One is just an extension of the other. So Proposition 300 was voted on in 1985 and implemented in 1986, and it lasted for 20 years. It was a half cent sales tax that went to funding our region's development. This included the 101, the 202, State Route 51, um, et cetera. And it expired in 2005. In 2004, voters voted to renew the, or extend the proposition as Proposition 400, and that was gonna be for another 20 years. So from 2005 to 2025. And this went to more investments in freeways and highways, but so um, part of it also went to investing in our arterial streets or the streets that we walk and drive along. And also part of it went towards investments in public transit. And so like I mentioned, Proposition 400, it is expiring in 2025 and so we have an opportunity to um, extend it yet again as a region and that's what is happening. Um, move to the next slide. Sorry it's hard to do both of these things at the same time uh, but we're learning. <laughs> um, and so what is coming up next is the Proposition 400 extension. It's also known as the Momentum Campaign or the Momentum Plan and this is going to be an extension of Proposition 400, instead of it being for the next 20 years, it will be for the next 25 years. Um, and so this is a snapshot of the plan that MAG has put forward. Um, and this is most likely going to be on your ballot in the fall. Um, the status update on this proposition and the reason it doesn't really have a name yet is because it's currently in our state legislature being reviewed though it is projected to pass through our state legislature and be on your ballot this fall. So you will most likely see something like Proposition 500 or I don't know what they're gonna call it, but as of now, it's in the status of, of the bill is that it is in the state legislature. Uh, the state legislature is having a lot of budget negotiations right now. So it's kind of being held as a, like a bargaining chip, but it is projected to pass through once those negotiations are over. So um, on my screen, you can see a quick snapshot of what the plan MAG is putting forward looks like. I'm also going to put in the chat the link to like explore this tool more um, um, and be able to see the visuals better because it, oh, I, I did it. No worries. No worries. Honey. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. Um, oh, I saw you copying it. Never mind. <laughs> um, so. You can poke around in the tool a little bit more when you um, have some free time, but essentially what you can see here is the plan that MAG has put forward for the, the next 25 years and what they're planning to do with the revenue from Proposition 400 extension. So everything that you see here in orange 
is proposed arterial street improvements. So that's proposed investments in, it, in the streets that we drive along. Anything that you see in green is extensions to the existing light rail. If you see anything in this dark red color, that's proposed rapid bus lanes. And then anything that you see in blue is more investments on freeway, highway expansion and improvement. So, you know, unfortunately there's quite a bit of money going to highway expansion, but the positive thing here in the area where we have an opportunity to come in and um, make a meaningful change is all of this orange. Are all of these arterial improvements are the area where we can come in and really push our, our regional leaders to invest in complete streets. And that's really the vision that we have here at Arizona and how at Chiefs Bay Arizona and how we're grounding ourselves in this campaign. We envision a future for the Valley that is complete streets. How amazing would it be for us to be able to walk out our doors and just walk to and from where we need to go and have tree shade and have sidewalks that are safe and far away enough from the curb and all of these great things that, that we're manifesting for ourselves and for our community. So to lend a definition, complete streets are streets that are designed and operated to prioritize safety, comfort, and access to destinations for all people who use the street, but especially people who have been left behind by systemic underinvestment and whose needs are not met by a traditional transportation approach. And these are really our folks who rely on public transit and active transit here in the Valley. Complete streets will make it easy for people to walk, bike, skate, and move actively with assistive devices. Complete streets will have trees and vegetation for shade. They'll allow buses to run and move on time. And they'll also make it safe for people to walk in between transit stations. And so uh, this is the vision that we have here at Chiefs of Arizona. We really hope that we can you know, push our, our region to invest in, in complete streets. And I think part of our work is providing feedback to the city as they're developing the plans that they are, which brings me to the end of my presentation. And I'm very excited to pass the mic over to the city of Phoenix. We're joined today by Karen Apple. She is the city of Phoenix electric vehicle program manager. And she's going to be presenting to us today on the draft electric vehicle roadmap that the city of Phoenix is hoping to finalize, I believe this summer, but she'll give you some more context on that, I'm sure. And then we're also joined by Darice Ellis, who will be taking notes and feedback from all of you at the end of the presentation when Karen is finished, we'll be able to provide direct feedback to this plan. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to Karen. Give me just one second to switch my screen to your presentation. And you're all set. Great, thank you, Sosan. Um, yes, my name is Karen Apple. I'm the Electric Vehicle Program Manager for the City of Phoenix in the Office of Sustainability. And I'm so happy to be here and present to you. And it's great having to follow Sosan and Jorge because it's a great segue into what I've got to present to tonight. So I was happy to hear um, Sosan that you presented on the vision and the goals and we, this plan directly aligns with some of the vision and goals that CHISPA has. One being that this plan is, one of the main goals of this plan is to improve air quality. Um, and again, help, help the, improve the health and um, respiratory ailments that some of our residents are facing. And then the second, goal that we align with in this particular plan is that you and CHISPA supports electrification of transportation. So again, uh, that is one of our main goals in the city of Phoenix is to, to use electric vehicles to improve the air quality and, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We know the majority of the greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to mobile sources, uh, i.e. vehicles and transportation sources. And then thirdly, where we align with CHISPA right now is certainly putting a focus on focus on equity. So we are very focused um, on that particular topic and want to um, hear from our underserved and underinvested community members of what their needs and wants uh, are in terms of electrification transportation options. So with that, let me kick it off and go to the next slide, please. So. 
again, the cities certainly understands we've got an air quality issue and greenhouse gas emissions are, are on the rise. So one of the ways and one of the strategies and what we call the solution for pollution, one, one solution is to um, implement electric vehicles and uh, look to increase the adoption of electric vehicles and EV charging infrastructure. So Mayor Gallego back in June of 21 established the EV ad hoc committee. And it's comprised of one city council member, which is Councilwoman Ansari from District 7, and 14 stakeholder members. And the stakeholder members are comprised of our local utilities, APS, SRP. We have a member of ASU Sustainability School. We've got Nicola. We've got a member of um, um, VNA Oliveria that represents some of our um, minority communities. So we've got some representation from policy and some developers. So we think we've, we've got a really good um, committee that's been meeting since last August to develop the EV roadmap. Um, and the purpose, again, they were, this particular committee was charged with developing an EV roadmap that is going to provide the city strategies and recommendations on how we can use this as a framework to guide our EV strategies moving forward. Um, again, as I mentioned, we've been meeting since August of 21. The committee will sunset at the end of June. Um, so we are kind of in our um, last final paces to get this thing across the line. Um, I like to say that we are on the 20 yard line and we're trying to push it across to the end zone. So we are really close and excited to provide you some recommendations tonight and get your feedback. Next slide, please. So the city um, council approved the climate action plan. And within the climate action plan, it had some aggressive electric vehicle goals. And our main target that we're looking to achieve is 280,000 electric vehicles will be our, in our community by 2030. And right now in city of Phoenix, we probably have registered about 8,000. So um, that's a lot of electric vehicles to get uh, charging stations installed for and policies and procedures and camp education campaigns. So that's our North Star and our target is 280,000 electric vehicles. Um, and the climate action plan said, here's how we're going to try to, to help support those 280,000 vehicles. We need to do um, education and outreach campaigns. What we're finding is a lot of our residents um, are not very knowledgeable about electric vehicles and there's a lot of myths and fallacies out there. So um, we, the city, need to get out and do a robust education and outreach campaign to the entire city and also do targeted outreach and campaign to our underserved areas um, to, to help do a deeper dive with those folks. We also have a goal in our climate action plan to install 500 electric vehicle charging ports on city managed property. So think uh, parks, libraries, public garages, uh, theaters, things like that. Um, the next is we want to explore electric vehicle building codes. So we have found that there is a whole population of folks that live in apartments that are um, lacking in the opportunity to charge their car. So therefore, they're at a deficit to buy a car. If they can't charge it, then their propensity to buy an electric vehicle is way um, low. So we need to find ways that we can work with the development community and our own planning and development department to start looking at how we can implement building codes that um, strongly suggest that developers put in the electric vehicle charging infrastructure when they're building new multifamily residential buildings or commercial properties. Next is we wanna acquire 200 light duty electric vehicles in our fleet. So the city has a really robust fleet. We have 7,500 vehicles, 3,500 of which are light duty vehicles. So we wanna transition 200 of those 3,500 vehicles 
into electric vehicles. And right now we have 13 in our fleet. So we have a big gap to close by 2030 to, to meet that goal. And, and um, I think we can meet it. And I also think we can exceed it. And then last and certainly not least um, is we wanna implement those equity principles. We wanna to listen to our underserved, uh, underinvested communities and find out what their needs are, mobility needs are, um, because as so Sosin said, elect an electric vehicle in the form of a car is not the answer for everyone. So it may be in the form of an electric bicycle or an electric scooter or a transit voucher or a ride share or a car share program. So we really want to get out and, and understand and take deep dives with our um, disadvantaged communities to find out what their needs are. So that was all in our climate action plan. And you're going to hear me talk about these again because we, we have somewhat mirrored, mirrored, mirrored them in our roadmap. So next slide, please. So the draft EV roadmap, um, next, next slide. So the draft EV roadmap, um, some, hold on just a second. That didn't come out right. So anyway, the draft EV roadmap, um, as I mentioned, the committee sunsets at the end of June we are in the final push to get comments collected on the EV roadmap. We will be going to city council for acceptance and approval on June 15th. So again, we are in the last um, pieces of our roadmap and we were really looking to get some feedback from this, from this team um, tonight and get any, answer any questions and get feedback. So this is our first recommendation that the ad hoc committee is recommending to the city is the, 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 the major recommendation is to support the accelerated EV adoption in the community. So how do we city um, develop programs and incentives so that more of our residents will buy electric vehicles or turn to an electrified mode of transportation? So um, it's a very robust effort and the, the committee recognized that we're gonna need um, the city's going to need dedicated staff to do all of this work that's coming down the pike, um, such as EV equity programs and EV charging programs and um, education and outreach just in general. So it's going to take some dedicated staff to do that. And another thing that they recommended under this goal is to, to launch qualitative and quantitative data, data gathering programs. So we understand that we need to understand where the EVs um, reside, who's purchasing them, um, what are the EV car sales, so that we can make informed decisions, so that we can deploy EV charging infrastructure and launch targeted campaigns and incentives. So we want to make data-driven decisions, so we need to get that data. And then thirdly, we want to launch the EV education and awareness campaign. And again, that will be focused on equity areas as well as the city in general. And you're going to hear me say education and air awareness probably three more times because it's, it's such the, the bedrock to getting people educated and aware and informed about electric vehicles. So it's very imperative that we do that um, to, to make this a successful um, and reach our goals. Next slide, please. The second draft recommendation, again, this was one that came straight straight out of the climate action plan, is to install 500 city hosted public charging stations. So right now, the city has 62 level two charging stations on city owned property. So there's some at Burton Bar, there's some at the 305 garage across from City Hall, there's some in our um, um, there's some at the Children's Museum, there's some at other libraries and libraries are getting ready to build out all the libraries with charging stations. So if we have 62, we need to get to 500 by 2030. So we've got a, a large gap to close. And what we're trying to do with this one is also leverage 
some of the federal infrastructure money. I think Sosin, you might have uh, inferred to this, but there are, there's federal um, funding coming down that is the purpose is to be used for charging stations. So again, we want to work with communities and be thinking, and we certainly would like your feedback if there's any locations that this, that CHISPA um, attendees would like to see the city locate some charging stations. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, again, we want to leverage our federal funding and, and, and host some of these in underrepresented and un, um, a, a compromised community. So um, again, any kind of feedback that you can give is greatly appreciated on where you think you'd like to see some charging stations at. Next um, slide, please. And the third recommendation out of the EV roadmap is to support access to home, business, and workplace charging. So we understand that about 80% of charging is done at home. But as I mentioned before, those folks that live in multifamily properties are, are lacking the access to EV charging. So we want to work with our development community and our planning department and, um, and businesses to either provide incentives or rebates or some kind of program that we can accelerate EV charging, whether it be at your single family home at a business for your um, patrons or even your employees. And then again, workplace charging because um, employees need to be charging as well. So we wanna look at those EV ready building codes that suggest um, and eventually mandate, not in the short term, but in the longer term, um, they're probably gonna, we're probably gonna have codes that mandate um, that EV chargers be installed at the time of a new build of multifamily or commercial building. Um, and again, education, education, education um, for builders and businesses on how they can get um, charging stations, work with the city, um, help with their help us, ha have us help them with permitting and anything that we can do to accelerate EV chargers being installed. Because again, um, we just got some data back from one of our surveys and one of the barriers to EV ownership is lack of EV charging. So it's very important that we, the city, do our part and install um, EV chargers and work with other um, businesses and developers to do to install EV chargers. Next slide, please. And then um, recommendation four is that, again, we are very focused and committed to equity principles and focusing on an equity um, principles as we are deploying EV charging stations, working with incentives and programs, again, to those underserved and in underinvested communities. So um, later this year, early next year, after we've uh, gotten a lot of data and had listening sessions, we will start to develop a pilot mobility project. Um, Again, it's a, it will be the committee recognized that it's a huge endeavor, so we need to dedicate a few more staff members to focusing on equity. Um, we want to um, implore more deep listening sessions in our underserved communities and really understand what their needs are, because as I mentioned earlier, it may not look like an electric car. It could be a, an electric bicycle or a scooter, rideshare, car share, vouchers to transit. Um, and light rail is electrified and we're working with our transit department to start doing some, they've already started doing some electric bus pilot pro programs. Unfortunately, our heat here really impacts the battery and the charge on those batteries. So, um, they're, they will continue to pilot electric buses. And then when they're ready, they will deploy them and get them in the fleet. But again, it's important that we launch a local model of mobility investment. So that is something that's important to the city. And it was important to the ad hoc committee. So we're advancing that as a recommendation. Next slide, please. So again, that just kind of gives you a general overview, but if you really want to look at the draft EV roadmap, it's about 30 pages and you can access it 
we have it both English and in Spanish. You can access it, ac um, access it at www.phoenix.gov backslash electric vehicles. I dropped the link in the chat box. So uh, you can review it, review the draft EV roadmap, and you can also, we'd really like some feedback if you could, and if you would fill out our survey, which is both in English and in Spanish. And it, it's about a 15 question survey and it asks um, how much you know about EVs, would you buy an EV, why wouldn't you buy an EV, um, and some other questions. So we'd really like your feedback and um, that's all of my presentation and I'm, I'm